everybody. So it's been a while since I've been posting regularly. Yeah, I wanted to touch base and kind of share where I've been. So, you know, you've probably seen some of my polls. If you're a longtime uh, follower of the channel, I'm always posting uh, polls to kind of see where the audience is at. And there's been a few uh, kind of vibe changes or seed changes. Um, the paradigm has been shifting slowly. Uh, so for those of us that have been in the space for a while, uh, you know, uh, glove and and uh, semantic embedding when that first came out, you know, Google's universal sentence encoder, um, those sorts of things came out, what, 2015, 2016? That was a paradigm shift, and then it was a few years before GPT-2, then a little bit less time for GPT-3, now GPT-4. Um, but not only not only is are the paradigm shifts compressing on individual companies, there's more of them as more companies participate. And so everyone has noticed this year, the, the joke is if you go more than eight hours without a you know, major breakthrough announced in AI, that's, that's the AI winter. And so this phenomenon is actually predicted perfectly by Ray Kurzweil in The Age of Spiritual Machines. And so having read this book, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't read the end. I, didn't, I, wasn't as, I, I didn't care as much about the predictions, um, but the data. Um, the timelines, the data, and the model that Ray uses to understand what's happening, that's what is really compelling to me. And so what you should be paying attention to as we ramp up to singularity or change or AGI or whatever is paradigm shifts. And so the way that Sam Altman described it is, uh, what was it? He said, slow takeoff with short intervals. And so those short intervals are these paradigm shifts. And so basically it's not going to be, you know, we wake up one day and AGI is there and then we have, you know, warp drive the next day. Instead, these paradigm shifts are uh, exemplified. You can even take it back a, a longer uh, timeline. So one example is looking at human evolution. And this has been used in a few different places. Um, they even talked about it in three body problem. I binged three body problem the other day when I wasn't feeling well. Um, and so the idea is how long did it take for humans to emerge or proto humans to emerge. It took more than a billion years of evolution for, you know, hominids to emerge. And then from there, it was a few million years to get to, you know, something that is recognizably human. And then only a few hundred thousand years to get to intelligence, 10,000 years to get to agriculture, a thousand years to get from pre-industrial to post-industrial and so on and so forth. And so human evolution is accelerating, not necessarily on a biological sense, but on a technological sense. And so there's been TED Talks that call this like teams, so like a technological uh, uh, gene where we're able to build off of each other. And so uh, another way of thinking about it is technology is evolution by another means. And in this respect, evolution is accelerating. So I ran a poll, and I, I think I think it's okay to talk about this because I ran a poll um, a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, that basically said, like, are we building a successor species? Are we building a global superorganism? And most of you are on board with this idea. So I'm, I'm still talking about this idea with some researchers and philosophers that I know. Um, I just sent them an email this morning. Um, but But the idea is that we are evolving. And it's because of the complexity of the situation, we don't know what we're evolving to. So most people that I've talked to agree that this is what's called a complex adaptive system. And so a complex adaptive system is when you have two or more uh, parallel systems or entities that feed off of each other and manipulate each other. So one of the most common examples is the stock market. And if you've been following the stock market at all over the last few years, you probably know like the meme stocks like GameStop. And so that's an example of a complex adaptive system where you have a marketplace or a stock price, and then you have like the Reddit people and the 4chan people, and then you have the finance people, and then you have the regulators. So you have multiple parties all trying to influence the system, um, and that's feeding off of each other. And so this is where you get things like pump and dump schemes. That is an example of, you know, by by manipulating the, the, na the, the, the numbers and the data and the narrative, you can get one behavior, and then the stock price changes, and that changes everyone's behavior, and so on and so forth. So artificial intelligence is also a complex adaptive system, just as the internet is a complex adaptive system. 
Um, and in aggregate, you know, there's the there's emergent qualities like what does the internet want? Uh, the incentives of the internet is is attention. You know, we've, we, you've probably heard of the attention economy, but why? The attention economy was not necessarily built by humans. The attention economy emerged as the the hunger of the internet because the internet is just built to pass data. That's what the internet wants, quote unquote. The internet wants to pass data. So the best way that it can pass data is by capturing your attention. And the best way to capture your attention is through things like social media, uh, Netflix and streaming services, and so on and so forth. And so from an aggregate perspective, from a, from a global perspective, you could say that, that the internet as the global nervous system wanted attention. And so it is the thing that invented social media. It is the thing that invented streaming services. And then, of course, as the demand for throughput for internet bandwidth goes up. So then the internet builds itself uh, larger and we are just the worker nodes, we're the ants, we're the drones building this larger system. Now, as we introduce artificial intelligence to the, into the system, it is another set of entities or it is another layer of intelligence and processing. And so the uh, the advent of AI, the, the integration of AI into the internet will change the structure of the internet again, change the structure of humanity and the global superorganism uh, again, by creating new affordances, new um, new desires, basically new emergent desires in this global superorganism. Now, another way that I characterize it is that if you look at humanity up until this point, and in aggregate, our behavior has been no different from you know bacteria spreading across the surface of a petri dish. We are as individual uh, atomized entities, just growing and reproducing and spreading um, until we fill up the petri dish. And now, of course, um, we're getting close to filling up the Petri dish. That's why uh, one of the reasons why, you know, things are more expensive, that's called economic compaction. Um, so competition gets higher, resources get more scarce, the environment starts to degrade so that the environment's ability to uh, sustain us is, de is degrading. All of this is perfectly predictable when you look at the growth of populations. And so basically we are at our natural carrying capacity. Now, I will admit that there are it, it is very likely that some technologies could ex extend the carrying capacity of the planet. But with our current technological level, we're actually beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. Um, you know, if everyone lived like Americans, you've probably heard like it would take three Earths to you know, support uh, everyone having an American lifestyle. It would take two Earths to have to support everyone living a European lifestyle. So we are we are currently we're an overshoot right now. Technology could change that, but then of course you might say, okay, well if we increase the carrying capacity, then we'll just expand that carrying capacity again. But getting back to the petri dish analogy, we in aggregate have no coordination. We have very little coordination. Just in the same way that, you know, a bunch of amoebas on a Petri dish or a bunch of, you know, bacteria on a Petri dish, they don't really coordinate. They just kind of grow mindlessly until they fill up their environment or they run out of food or whatever. But the Internet is the first phase of creating an actual intelligent species, an actual global in, uh amount of coordination. The fact that I can have global reach as an individual thinker, as an individual contributor to the human race, and that there are literally hundreds of thousands of more people like me um, talking on every issue, not just artificial intelligence, but on social issues, political issues, legal issues. Um, the fact that that um, all of us mavens, that's kind of an information term, um, the people that aggregate specific topics and then you know, rebroadcast it to make sense of the world. That's why I have an audience base. That's what you people like. Um, when you tell me in the comments, like you want the distilled ideas to what's going on. And that's the purpose of this video is to like, Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's level set. Let's, let's, uh, recalibrate. So, um, with artificial intelligence, which is, um, even if it has desires of its own, even once it becomes agentic, it's going to be somewhat orthogonal to our interest, just in the same way that the internet is somewhat orthogonal to our interest. What the internet wants is not necessarily what's best for us, which is why social media is toxic, because the internet, as a hive mind, as a super intelligence, as a digital entity, is already an alien form of intelligence. You're already working with alien intelligence. It's just bigger. You can't really see it. You're already working with a hive mind. Um, now, when you add artificial intelligence as another layer to that, the internet then becomes more conscious. And I don't mean conscious in a philosophical sense. I'm not saying that it has subjective experience, that the, it, you know, it is something to be like the internet. What I mean is that it can be more deliberative, it can be more conscientious and intentional about what it does and what it wants. And it, particularly as we have AI co-pilots helping us. And so one example I've been using recently is perplexity. And so what, what Ray talks about in his book 
is the difference between order and chaos. And so artificial intelligence brings order to chaos. And that order is also what causes acceleration. And so perplexity is, I think, right now the best example of a tool that fundamentally changes our our uh, our relationship to information, because like yes, chatbots like Claude and stuff that are that are closed off from the internet, they're very helpful, but their only I/O is you. Uh, whereas perplexity, it can go talk to the internet for you. All these other um, uh, agents and stuff that are that have tool use and API use, you're not the only I/O that they have access to. But what happens when you introduce these tools? is your access to information, one, becomes much, much faster. If you've used tools like Perplexity to do research, you will know that it is 100 times less, less effort, effortful than just using Google. It, the tool sells itself very, very easily. Um, now, not only is it less effortful, that means that it is faster, and it also generally produces higher quality. And so for, for some people that I've seen go through the journey of before perplexity and after perplexity, um, their information literacy goes up by default. Their media literacy goes up by default because it is baked into the tool. Now, this will, on an individual level, you might say, oh, hey, I have a better understanding of issues out in the world. I have a better access to scientific information, political information, economic, whatever information that you're looking for, you have better access to it. But now repeat that 8 billion times. Once 8 billion people have access to tools like Perplexity, that's going to change the entire information landscape and bring a lot more order to the chaos that is the internet today. Now, you might say, okay, what is, what's the difference? What does that mean? Why does that matter? And the reason is because these paradigm shifts, these, in, these accelerating paradigm shifts that we've all been feeling, you know, uh, chat GPT was the first big like global paradigm shift. Um, and I think that Sora and those other kinds of tools are going to be the next one, maybe GPT-5, maybe Llama 3. Um, but those paradigm shifts are going to get closer and closer together uh, because we're bringing more and more order to the chaos. And right now it's just language. Um, you know, there's AlphaFold 2, which brings a little bit more order to um, the, the biotech landscape. Um, but that's going to accelerate. That's going to compress. And so AI, you know, when when GPT-2 and GPT-3 first became a thing, a lot of people were like, as the as the internet was trying to understand, like, what is it that we've made? A lot of people said, oh, it's just a kind of compression. You've just compressed the entire internet into one model. And that's actually, from an information perspective, that's not actually a bad way of thinking about it. Because if you can embed literally all of human knowledge into a few trillion parameters or, you know, 100 billion parameters... That's a pretty significant amount of compression that has happened. But also, it's not just compression. It is then also interactive. It is now an information entity. And by entity, I don't mean like, you know, uh, a being. I just mean that it is a self-contained uh, apparatus um, that allows you to have access to pretty much any information that you need. And that is also accelerationist. And so basically, you know, the, the whole point of this video is that acceleration is the default and you can look at it not from an intuitive perspective. So my last video, uh, you know, was a little bit controversial, um, but my point is you can't trust your intuition. Our, our Savannah monkey brains are not evolved to intuitively understand what's going on. Our emotional brains, our limbic system is also not evolved to really understand what's going on. You might, you might feel the vibe shift, right? You might, you might feel um, that, that things are changing, the way that people are talking about this is changing. But in terms of modeling it, in terms of understanding it, the only way to really understand it is looking at it from a mathematical perspective. And so from a mathematical perspective, you say, okay, what does the advent of chat GPT and Claude and perplexity, mathematically, what does this do to individual interactions, individual relationships, my, like for instance, my relationship to um, you know, the rest of the world, your relationship to me, your relationships with each other, your relationship to your government, your relationship to other governments. And so, and I don't have the answer for this because this is kind of a new area of interest for, for myself and I'm talking to people, um, but it all comes down to relationships and incentives. And a, an example as to why it's kind of difficult to predict this, going back to the complex uh, adaptive system aspect, is that uh, the, it was not obvious what the internet would, it, would invent. The internet was built to carry data, right? You know, you, you go back and even look at Bill Gates talking about internet in the early days. It's like, it's going to, you know, accelerate business, which that was correct. Um, you know, but all he could imagine was that it would be good for email. 
right? But then as the internet got better and better, it's, it became good for commerce and retail, and then it became good for social commentary and entertainment and literally everything else that the internet has become good for now. And as the internet got bigger, as the internet became a more powerful system with its own intrinsic or emergent desires, um, it has captured more and more of our attention, more and more of our money. Um, it's even captured my career and is making me wear <laughs> a Star Trek outfit on the internet because 70% of you uh, in the audience really like this. Um, so, and this is, this is me being influenced by this digital superorganism. Okay. So that was, that was quite a tangent, but what I want to do is I want to get back to kind of like, what are these new paradigms that are coming again? It's, you know, uh, rapid iterations, short cycles, but sort of slow takeoff. I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as slow takeoff because the, the net f- ability of AI is more than doubling every six months. Um, and so that's an exponential takeoff. Granted, if the if the iteration cycle is three to six months right now, um, then it's going to be you know one to three months next year, and then several weeks you know the year after that. So it's really looking like 2025, 2026 is when things really kind of ramp up quickly. Um, not that it's ramping up quickly right right now, but yeah, I think you get the idea. So there's a few other books that I've been reading to try and really get an understanding of what's coming. So. One, this was recommended um, to me uh, several times, actually, so the Listening Society. I will caution that the opening, the introduction in the first chapter is a, a what I will say is a little bit cringy, because um, the author really seems to be super, super full of himself, and I think that there's probably cultural reasons for that, but once you get into the meat of the book, it's actually, it's actually pretty interesting um, when he's talking about kind of the social paradigms, and he has a really, really good way of articulating the different tribes that we see today, like the conservatives and the nationalists versus the yoga instructors and the hippies. And like, he just has a really, really um, kind of lighthearted and humorous way of poking fun at literally everyone. But he, but not only just characterizing the social groups that are out there, why they exist, what forces are driving those social groups. Um, so this is a very insightful book as to how society is evolving. Um, another one is that I'm still in the middle of is Abundance by Peter Diamandis. So this one uh, talks a lot about um, kind of those, those, in, those emotional intuitive failures amongst many, many other things. But again, it takes a very uh, it takes a very like numbers based, a math based. Because again, if you can't trust your emotions, if you can't trust your intuition, you need math and you need data in order to understand what's happening. And then I finally just got my copy of uh, Deep Utopia. I haven't uh, cracked into this yet, um, but Liv Bowery has an interview with Nick Bostrom about this. And so this is where I'm at. This is I'm trying to say, okay, the paradigm shifts are compressing. Um, so what does that mean? And, and like I said, it's going to be pretty difficult to anticipate what the next paradigms are. Now, of course, people like Ray Kurzweil and others, um, they have a good track record of, of more or less accurately predicting some aspects of the paradigm shifts. Um, but it, we do, from here on out, we have to take a very data and model and uh, numbers-oriented uh, understanding of what is happening and what is coming and why. Um, so those are some books that I would recommend uh, to understand what's happening. And then the final two are, um, so I mentioned a while back that I was reading basic economics, which, um, so what I will say is that Thomas Sowell is considered like a fringe conservative quack by some people, um, and considered like Jesus by others. And then, a, a, a counter narrative is capital by Thomas Piketty. So this actually came from, from you guys, uh, in the audience, some, some of you folks recommended this. And, I will say that Thomas Piketty is like the opposite. Like he's like left wing fringe. And so um, reading both of those to get a, to get a good cross section of like modern economic theory and where different people are coming from really helpful for understanding post-labor economics as well as the listening society um, to understand like, okay, how, how will economics change and how will human humanity change? I'm still in the middle of working on it. So I apologize that I don't have, you know, the answer to say like, Hey, this is what's happening next. Um, but I hope that that uh, it's it's starting to become a little bit more clear where we're at and where we're going. Um, yeah, so back to work for me to understand all of this that's going on. Um, another couple pieces of, of news. My novel is almost done. Um, I'm doing a proofreading pass now. Um, it's formatted. It looks really good. I've got the cover art. Um, so that's coming. And then also post nihilism. I know that a lot of you people have been looking forward to when I get this book. So because of recent conversations I've had, uh, I think that post nihilism is 
Um, at least all the content is on the page. I'm going to need to give it a few passes to make sure that it's cleaned up. But after more than two years of working on post nihilism, I think the model is complete. I think the book is complete. Um, now it's just a matter of cleaning it up and packaging it up, packaging it so that it is presentable. Um, yeah, that's what I've been up to. So thanks for watching. Sorry for the delay. Um, but I have been hard at work, um, even if I haven't been as available and as present as I would like to be. Um, but yeah, that was, that was all just because I sensed that paradigm shift. And now I'm understanding I've got a better model for what those paradigm shifts represent, why they're happening, and what to anticipate, at least in the short term. So thanks for watching. Cheers. Have a good one.